Welcome to Bible study. And last week we were, uh, we had a look at Romans 9, I think it was, and, and this, this thing about divine hardening. So, I, um, and, and actually part of the original question that we had last week was asking us to think about this divine hardening and whether that has anything to do with um, predestination or is there a connection to, to predestination? So, uh, after going through all of the divine hardening, looking at the, looking at the example of Pharaoh and and all of uh, various other examples in the Bible, I, I think we that's we, we landed quite well on on the subject of the the hardening of the heart and divine hardening. Um, and this week, the the follow on really, which was part of the original question, is is this thing of predestination. So we, we have the homework to have a look at predestination. Um, what is it? Uh, what is predestination? What's your understanding of predestination? Whether it's something that you've read, whether it's something that you've been taught, or whether it's something that you see in the Bible or you've seen in the Bible, um, to say this is your understanding of, of predestination. And when we look at um, predestination itself, uh, what for example, we know that the one when we hear about predestination, you always hear about Calvinists. Um, so the Calvinist approach, for example, what do we know for those that have read about that? What do we know about that? And is is it correct? Is it aligned with the scriptures fully? Uh, is it not aligned? So that's the introduction. And so I'm going to leave it there for let, let's start with. The, the the definition of of predestination itself so um, the floor is open and don't be shy uh, brother T, uh, thank you um may i i just share something there um oh, yes, please. Uh, i i went just to let you all know um i went to university in cardiff and uh, there's a fair number of christians there were into Calvinism and the Calvinistic definition of predestination mm. and uh, I read a bit about it of course um, is coming across I don't know what you all think but that certain people are predestined to be saved and others aren't according to the teachings of John Calvin. Now, I don't personally, from my understanding of the New Testament, I don't think that's biblical at all. I don't know what you all think. Yep. Thank you, Pastor Paul, for that contribution. So that is, that's quite a good summary of what I've seen to be the definition of, of Calvinism. So anybody else? And then we can get into into what we you know how we think that aligns with with the scriptures. So uh, what we've just heard, uh, I think you will read the, the the teaching of of John Calvin, and and there are um, th there's a spectrum to it as well. So you you would read about things such as hyper Calvinism. So they, but in in the main and and in in, in simple terms, what what uh, Calvinism seems to um, be teaching or, 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 or seem to be professing is that um and particularly if we if we look at the case of salvation is that you know some people have been chosen by god um to be saved and some basically have been chosen to that they will not make it and that they will end up in hell um that's probably another way of trying to define um what's what is being taught by calvinism but yeah that that there is a predestination for those that will be saved and and will, will will live in eternity with god and and others and some are, are predestined to to not make it it just says it basically says that everything um so kind of connecting it to what we were looking at last week as well it's this thing that everything has been um set by god um in in a way um particularly with when it comes to our eventual uh, destination in life. I mean, a little bit like the word 
the predestination and your your destiny has been has been chosen selected uh, and it would say that certain people will make it and be saved and certain people um we will not um now if if we take that definition and we look at things that we um we have come to understand in the bible you know th there's this thing about free will so predestination would suggest that it doesn't really matter you don't you don't have free will um and, and that's where i would start by saying that i i i don't um see how that's congruous with what we see in the scriptures because if if we don't have you know we, we've been taught that if if your free will has been taken away from you then you know it's it's like puppeteering really so we're just we're just little pieces on this earth um and then what's the point of life is what i would add to it if if you don't then don't have that free will um you know the free will to receive the gospel the free will to uh, push away the free will to reject the free will to do things in other ways that god uh, probably would like you not to do it um those things are essentially being taken away from you if predestination or the the principle or the, or the theology of predestination is correct um so yes and any any other thoughts questions it does get a little bit confusing depending on how much you read so um you know, it'll be good for us to to just try and build that foundation, which is why we started with the. Uh, let's see what the 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 word predestination means, or what is the definition of predestination as per the uh, the doctrine that's professed by by John Calvin. All right, so I think. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, good evening. Yes, Brother. Yeah, I think like Pastor Paul, um, I also agree that at least my the, my understanding is the Calvinistic approach to Romans chapter nine, and in fact they use uh, Romans chapter nine seems to be one of their main um, backing scriptures to to back up this thing about um, about um, their five points. Um, their five points um Calvinistic approach. Yeah. So um and what the this this is one of the main scriptures that they used to talk about how that God has pre-selected those who will be saved. Mm. Um and basically they're not in that in that um in that uh, in that part of the equation then you know you can, there's nothing you can do about it. Um and I, but, I, but I think to even understand um, what they mean, because when we come across this, we've got to be able to, um, with grace, um, you know, uh, defend the scriptures and also hopefully maybe even correct, uh, because some, uh, some, some Calvinists have been, some staunch Calvinists have been known to, um, for their eyes to be open and they have the sins converted and repented and come back, come back to the, message of grace uh, you know in christ um but i think for us for firstly we need to understand what it is so that we can actually stand up to it um if for anything to protect ourselves from being carried away um but also then to understand what actually predestination means well at least from what we from what the scripture says and i think um as a as a backdrop um i think there's a the pastor has already thought on this in the past and, and that teaching i also i definitely agree with where the predestination is actually in christ mm. um but the calvinistic one stems off uh, i don't know if you, you guys have heard of they have a five point thing that they stand on and in a sense if you study it it's actually it's actually one thing repeated in five different ways <laughs> <laughs> so believing one you believe everything and if you can prove one to be untrue <laughs> then you practically prove all of it to be untrue. Mm. Um, so they have this thing called Tulip, which is their five um, points of, about total depravity, mm -hmm. um, unconditional election, which is the U. L is limited atonement. Mm -hmm. um, I is irresistible grace. And then five is perseverance of the saints. 
and and it, it might seem that they're different, but when you examine it deeply, you realize that it's actually the same thing that they're saying all over again in five different ways. Um, but to understand what they what they mean by what their predestination is, you've got to understand what they mean by total depravity, because we can we can hear total depravity and think that uh, that we are talking about the same thing because. Um, we, we, when we read scriptures, we see that man is totally depraved. But the right. depravity that the Calvinists talk about is actually different from what the Bible, <laughs> so where, where the man is totally depraved um, before God in the sense that we're completely lost, right? Where there's no good in us. There's nothing we can't, there's nothing in us that can save us. We can't, we can't help ourselves. We can't, um, uh, when the Bible says that the heart of man is desperately wicked, is actually saying that the heart of the man, the fallen man, is that's what it actually is. Yeah. Um, you know, when people say that I am good, I think I'm, I'm okay, I've done well, I give arms and everything, you know, when you compare that to what the Bible says, the Bible says you are totally depraved. Even your best efforts, the, your, the best of what you can do is totally vile before God, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why you need a savior, right? So to that extent, um, yes, we are depraved, but the Calvinistic, what they mean by total depravity is actually something different. What they're saying is that they, they agree that man is totally depraved, that you can't save yourself and everything, but they're even saying that you don't even have the option, the will to save yourself. So their understanding is that regeneration happens before faith in Christ. I don't know if you're here, you, 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 we understand that. What they mean is that God has to. No. Sorry. Hello. Uh, Karen, sorry. Oh, so, okay. So what they mean by that? What what they mean by total depravity is that um, even the, the 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 choosing Christ. You know, when you when the message the message of Christ is preached to you, and maybe when the Holy Spirit then convicts you and you choose to place your faith in Christ for salvation. Well, the Calvinists say that that's not possible. That you can't do that like it's not you don't have because you are dead you don't you, you you don't have the ability to actually believe in christ so their theory or their point is that regeneration god quickens you in your dead state before you place your faith in him so all that thing where paul was saying in romans 10 about um for the man for the, the heart man believes on salvation and with the heart man confesses or you know I, I, i'm mixing it up with a hard man believe it with the mouth he confesses um for the calvinist that happens after you've been saved after you've been regenerated um so that's what the total depravity means for them without going into too much the same thing unconditional election means that god has um um elected some unconditionally so yes nothing you, you can't it's not because you place your faith in him that he, he that election has happened way before you were even aware of it right um it was and it's because of his regeneration that you become aware and then of course you're you then realize that you're elected and then limited that atonement again follows through saying because not everybody's going to be saved and because some have been uh, elected beforehand then the atonement of christ was limited that's what they mean by limited atonement that it's, it's only limited mm -hmm. to those who have been elected are we, are, 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 we, are we together? Then irresistible grace is that if you have been elected, you have no choice but to be elected. You can't, you can't resist. So if you're one of those who God has chosen, you can't refuse that call. And mm -hmm. if you're one of those God, whom God has not chosen, you can't believe your way into that call. <laughs> That's the doctrine of irresistible grace. And then perseverance of the saints means that um, if you are chosen, if you are called, you can, there's nothing you can do. You can never ever get to the point where you even say you want to reject Christ. Yeah. Again, again, we see from scriptures that that's not true because there's a case of apostasy and the Bible clearly calls out those who had been sanctified, which means they were saved and they reject. So, um, which, are, which is why we say that these five things are actually one thing repeated in five different ways. Now, their, their predestination means that that's what they mean by predestination, that You've been chosen. You had. You have no part in salvation. You're, even what, what we, when we say, "I place my faith in Christ," that's that's not something you can do. You don't place of, for 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 them. You don't place your faith in Christ to receive 
salvation, you place your faith in Christ because you become aware after you have been born again and God is the agent of that born again, right? That he makes you alive before you can place your faith in him. Do you see where the confusion is? Yeah. Now, that's I totally reject. And like, first of all, um, there's, a, it, there's a lot of variations and depth to that um, and it can be very confusing. But that, for me, I, I reject that, that proposition and therefore reject all the five tenets of the Calvinist, uh, Calvinistic people. Um, mm -hmm. My understanding of predestination is this, that God has... Uh, yeah, good night, good night. Take care. Have a good one. Sleep well. Yeah. Um, sorry, um, what was I? You're saying your, your own... Yes, yes, yes. So I think from scriptures, when we look at scriptures, the, the, my understanding of predestination is that... Um, and by the way, uh, again, sorry, before I go there, there are two things that they look at in this scripture, or at least more than two things, but two main things that they look at. They look at the statement of God when he says that, um, firstly, they talk about the, the Isaac and Ishmael theme, and then, but more particularly, the Jacob and Esau theme. That's actually the stronger one that they hold on to, to back their um, predestination theme. But if we study scriptures, we, we, we find that the when God says that um, um, for not all those who are children of Israel are children of Israel, and he uses the example of Isaac and um, Ishmael, that is actually talking about um, that this is by promise, that being a child of Abraham spiritually is by promise, not by, not by blood, not because you, are, you, you were born by him. Um, and the example he uses is Ishmael and Isaac, because Ishmael was born is in a sense a seed of Abraham, but that seed because but because it's a seed of Abraham, he came out of Abraham. Doesn't mean that he's part of um, this spiritual Israel that we're talking about because this is this is by promise. God determines that is a, a promise he made to Abraham and is going to come through Isaac, and so everybody who is not in Isaac is precluded. So in Isaac is the promise established, but remember that Isaac is a type of Christ. And remember that everything that happens in the Old Testament is actually a type of who Christ is. So what God is saying is that it is in Christ that that promise is established here. Everybody who is in Christ is automatically a seed, spiritual seed of Abraham. Does that make sense? So it is in that, it's in that calling, when, as a person to natural Israel, it's in the predestination was in Isaac, right? With yeah. us, the predestination is in the greater son, of God, which is Christ. So Jesus really is everybody who is in Christ that has been elected. So this election that we're talking about, you're elected because you place your faith in Christ. And when you're in Christ, you have been predestined, predestinated to salvation, to eternal life, right? That's what, so that's one example. The, uh, that's what the Jacob Isaac thing, sorry, the Isaac and Ishmael thing represents. Now, when it comes to the Jacob and Esau thing, again, when we study scriptures, it says, Isaac I have loved and Jacob I have hated, right? Now, the, the word hated can be, um, can be confusing because we say, how does, how does God hate? But it doesn't, it doesn't talk about hate in the sense that, um, um, that we, we might think about it. It actually talks about the hatred there is actually that God has rejected Esau. If you do a bit more study, you actually find out that that's actually talking about works versus grace. So one, the first one, Isaac and Ishmael is talking about it's by promise, not by blood. And then just in case you're saying, okay, well, I mean, the promise, I mean, I mean Isaac, and I mean Isaac, so, and you are rejoicing. But if you then begin to fall on the side of works, which is what Esau would do, right? So firstly, by birth, he was meant to be the, the, the one who, who, um, is the firstborn, um, but God, in a sense, in his own foreknowledge, rejects that and chooses and chooses Isaac, um, Jacob. That firstly says that God is saying that hatred, that hatred that he's talking about, is a rejection of Esau, and particularly yes. the works that accompany Esau. Yes. So God is saying that if it's by works, you're already declared, you are, you are rejected, right? And he's saying by this is not by works, it is by grace. Because God says, I will have mercy. That mercy is his grace. He's saying that 
in this thing, in this election, in this predestination that I'm talking about, it is by grace, right? And we know in Christ, it is the grace of God that saves us. The Bible says, by grace are you faith, saved through faith, not of works that any less any man should boast. So what that second example is talking about is really the, um, the issue of grace versus works. The first one is promise versus blood, right? So he says, firstly, um, it's because I've promised, uh, it, the election is in promise and Christ is the promise. Um, and then secondly, the election is of grace, not of works again. And we know that Christ is the grace of God for the grace of God. Um, the Bible says that the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. So that's what that really, those two things are dealing with. Just in case we come up with Calvinists who try to use that to tell us to prove their predestination thing. One was actually dealing with the fact that this is by promise. So you can't say because Abraham is your father, you by, by, by naturally just become that. Otherwise, Ishmael will lay claim to the, and all the other brothers, because Abraham had other children apart from Isaac and Ishmael, right? But it's only in Isaac that the promise is established. And then Esau and Jacob represent that it's not by works, but it's by grace. So Esau represents works. Jacob represents the grace of God. I will have mercy upon whom I have mercy. Now coming to that, without knowledge, coming to what is predestination, which we've already answered. And I think Pastor Oza has already taught us on this in the past, that that predestination that the Bible is talking about is in Christ, that in this promise, in the seed of Abraham, the promise that God made, which we know um, Isaac is a type of, um, and the true promise is actually Christ himself. It's in that promise, in the, anyone who is in the promise, who is a seed of that promise, by faith, who places their faith in him, who come to him and receive the grace. So it's not by their works of righteousness, it's not by their own, uh, um, um, not anything they can attain unto, though, or they can walk towards, or they can um, become in their own works but by the grace of God, by the mercy of God, which is what they obtain through placing their faith in him, which is what Paul really explains in Ephesians chapter 2, where he says, by, by grace are you saved through faith, right? By grace are you saved through faith. When you place your faith in Christ, that is the grace of God kicks in, in, in and causes you to be become part of the elected. That's why he says that um, you are... Um, you have, you have, you have, uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, he says, uh, how does he put it now? Let me just go there so I don't paraphrase. I hope I'm, I hope I'm making sense and I'm not rambling too much. Um, hello? Can you, am I? It's, it's making sense, yeah. yeah. In Ephesians chapter 1, um, how does he put it in verse 5, I think? It calls us... Um, Let, 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 me just, let me just read it from verses 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the Lord and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, according as he has chosen us in him. So we are chosen in him. We are the elect of God in Christ. So this is the promise of God. God has promised that in Christ, before the foundation of the world, in Christ, people will be saved. People will be restored back to the God's intent in Christ. He has chosen us. This, so this election is in Christ. When we come to Christ, we are chosen. This predestination that we're talking about happens in Christ by placing our faith in Christ and um, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So Christ, God predestinated us to be holy and without blame in Christ. That, that's, that, that's what um, this predestination means. And then he makes claim, verse five, he says, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace, wherein he, he had made us accepted again in the beloved. So that's, that's what that predestination is that in Christ, as many who place their faith in Christ um, are, are, are adopted into his family, they are chosen in him, they are accepted in him, they, they come to Christ in him. Um, if the Calvinist position is true, 
then in a sense, this God we're serving will not be will be very, very un, uh, unjust and unrighteous because you can't have determined who is going to be saved. And then at the same time, you're saying you're commanding all men to be saved when you know that not all of them, they can't be saved, right? Mm -hmm. they do, uh, and it's not like they can't even save, they don't, they don't have the option because if you have already chosen them for damnation, then um, isn't, isn't it hypocritical if you then say that you want all men everywhere to be saved? Does that make sense? Yeah. That's the problem with the Calvinistic position. It's not congruous with the rest of scripture. It, is, it doesn't mimic or reflect the nature and the character of God. And the fact that God is God's heart is yearning for all creation to come back to him in Christ. Um, yeah, that's my understanding. I just thought, let me just leave it there so I don't take up the whole time. Yeah, mm -hmm. I hope that that has helped a little bit. Thank you, Brother Sanjay. That's um yeah certainly helped and i you've taken it to where i was going to take us next in in looking at the, the you know the the famous five points and actually trying to understand what those things are and and i'm pleased that you've helped us to see and maybe with a bit more study as well that those five things pretty much point to themselves as well um so that's 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 actually some good foundation that we've got there so any any thoughts questions and and as i said these things can be a little bit or seemingly confusing because sometimes some of it's even like circular arguments right because you just on that point that brother you finished mm -hmm. on how how can how can we say that only a certain number of people are going to be on one part a certain number on, on the other part i.e. some are saved, some are not saved. And then uh, the scripture says, oh, you know, all, all, men, all men are saved, all men are to be saved, or that God's will is for that we all... Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we all be saved, yeah. 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 So... so Brother Tim. Yes, uh, Pastor Paul. Um, I want to thank Brother for what he shared. And um, I, I'm sort of a very similar opinion because, I mean... If you take this this way the Calvinists see predestination is a logical conclusion, I don't know what you all think, but I think it's like fatalism. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a choice, it's it's like fatalism, as I think the thrust in the New Testament is a choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whosoever will may come. The yeah. famous verse, John 3, 16, whoever believes. Yeah, yeah. And like you've both correctly shared, the general invitation, the Great Commission and the gospel going to everybody. Mm. Not a select few. I don't see that's in keeping with the character of God at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you all think, you know. I agree. Um, yeah, so those are the, the, the various elements. So we, we got into this by looking at, um, the, once again, the link from last week um, into this this thing about divine hardening and, you know, God. And, and even then last week when we talked about it, we, we talked about how God used those that already had their hearts hardened in a way i.e pharaoh and a couple of others that we looked at um and and god worked with them if we want to say that right god could not force them uh in a particular in a particular way right to do a particular thing but you know god still allowed them to have their their free will to do certain things um so yeah yeah, yeah but pastor said last week that you know if 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 God was responsible for the the soul hardening of the heart, then why would He punish the guy whose heart has been been hardened? Because that's against the character of God to do to to do such a thing. So I think that's really critical to to looking at this Calvinistic approach that the the way and when you break it down, um, is the things that are being professed that actually don't line up with what we understand God's character to. To, to be and the way that God operates and wants us to operate. So we, we need to um, 
yeah, we need to spend time to look at these things and and study it and like like all things um theology which tends to get get a little bit technical it, it might take a few reads and and you might be surprised that certain people that they will say now fall into this belief or so certain famous names that you will now hear or certain um denominations that you will now hear actually that this is more about uh they more they, they tend more towards um um towards calvinism but my my hope and my prayer is that by opening this up and looking at this rather than trying to turn turn everyone to theologians that we we can at least have ourselves prepped and ready because these are the things that people would ask us um whether they be christians or people even outside christianity will try to ask us and say you know how come so and so would say this and you would say this as well so that we can have that foundation for us to be able to counter or explain those things, not necessarily counter the argument all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, has there been anything that's not clear in what we've heard so far or confusing or seems to be conflicting? Let's, let's, um, let's flesh it out so that we can, we can have that discussion amongst ourselves and and help, help ourselves to get to a place where we, we at least have a, a common understanding. Hello? Hello? Yes. You still me? Yeah. Am Did I too early it? or too late? <laughs> I didn't even look at the time. I just turned it on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, not too late. You're not too late. Uh, did you have a, a question or a contribution? No, I just joined. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. What, what you've missed is a fabulous discussion on, on uh, Calvinism and predestination. But you can you can always listen to it again on, on on YouTube. So so today we've been we've we've kicked on from last week where we looked at um, divine hardening and Romans nine, um, and and whether that has anything or any similarities to predestination or this concept of predestination. So so far today, mm -hmm. and for anybody else that may just be joining, we've been looking at predestination, what what that really is, and. Um, whether the Calvinistic approach or the Calvinist approach um, is is correct um, and even is biblical. So we, we've spent some time looking at what John Calvin was the, um, uh, I guess was the, uh, was maybe, the author might be a strong, a strong word. I mean, it, I guess he didn't even call it the Calvinistic approach or wrote the Calvinism and that was named after him, but that was his teaching. It was this five point uh, and, and in some variants, you will see a seven or eight point, and you, you see uh, ultra Calvinism, new Calvinism, and all of these ver ver variants. But it's it's around those five things that that Brother Tunji mentioned, which is um, uh, the acronym is Tulip, which is total depra depravity, unconditional election, uh, L for limited and atonement, um, irresistible grace, and the other one is a perseverance of the saints uh, being the last one um, so the, those are the things that we'll see um, so all right okay. um that was my my quick summary again um so we will see that this is sometimes it gets you know, some generally gets talked about in, in in the context of salvation um and sometimes it gets talked about uh, outside salvation as well which can also be some of the other confusing parts to this uh calvinism thing but but ultimately it's i think what bro the, the contributions that we've had so far helps us to see that this thing about um you know salvation by grace and us coming to um to receive the gospel and and it, those things cannot you know those things we know to be true by uh, through the scriptures and and they cannot hold true if you if you try to hold to this thing that god has just predestined that a certain set of people will will live with him forever and a certain set of people will will languish in hell forever 
um, Brother Tim. Yes, um, yes. Something I think I should share with the group. Um, just came back to my memory. Um, to look in the uh, background, um, Calvinism, as we call it, or the Tulip as Brothers, correctly expounded, and I understand the same thing, um, is actually not altogether original. If you look at the teachings of St. Augustine of Hippo in the third century in North Africa, St. Augustine pretty much taught what Calvin and the Calvinists taught, mm. as in, as we've had explained to us very clearly by a brother on the tulip. And to give you some background, I've done some search on this and one of my friends, uh, brother Paul Barnes in Basildon. Um, we looked into this and um, there was an error going around at that time called manicurism in the third century AD. And if you look at what Augustine taught, who was influenced by the manicurists and the error of manicurism, that is the real origin of what we term as Calvinism or the tulip, as a summary, as brothers explained. And it didn't just come about by John Calvin, who's this Frenchman in Geneva, Switzerland in the 16th century. It goes, it, and I can send you material on it as well. It goes back to the third century, to the, manic, the era of manicurism. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, Pastor Paul. Yeah, so I, I I came across this link or this reference all the way back to um, Augustine as well. Um, and, and as you say, yeah, it's it, like with some of these things. That's why I also then mentioned the. In some instances, you will see this seven is a seven or eight points of, and and that's just been another variance, right? That's just a, a rehashing of pretty much the um the, the, the that's right really what augustine and the manicurist taught in the third century yeah mm. so um yeah all of this isms once you start getting into it you then discover something else so i i, I have to say I'm, I'm hearing manicurism for the first time so i need to read up on that but you get so many of these isms that um can be quite interesting but um yeah, well, Brother Paul Barnes, he's also was a missionary in India, with the OAM Operation Mobilization. I'm, in all fairness, he probably has done more research than me, but we, we're in regular contact. And if, if, you know, if you need any help with the research, like articles or books or what have you, we can, um, we'd only be too happy to um, supply you with the names of the books or links and websites or what have you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Pastor Paul. Okay, any any other questions on this or thoughts on this? So we have we have about fifteen minutes left, so we can either take any more thoughts or questions, or we we'll see if there are any new questions. So, to touch on. And just to say, um, um, uh, Tim, I just want to add this to it. Just, just in case you know we're on the call, we're thinking, you know, why are we talking about this? What, what, of what use is this to us? How does it affect my daily living and my Christian work and everything? Mm -hmm. um, well, it actually does, <laughs> and it's good to actually know and be aware of that because um, one of the things that the, the, the way um, um, errors and erroneous teaching gets into the body is through something that looks very i mean because you you could see it with with them um, some of these people and they when you're talking about other parts of scripture and everything very sound very thin but then when they get here um the way it is manipulated or taught um, um because they might not even think they're manipulating it but the way it's taught if you're not careful and you're not discerning and you you one is not sound with god's word and what it means um you will be, you might even say, okay, initially it doesn't really matter, but seeds have a way that they, they are sown and eventually when they are watered, they begin to produce fruit. 
And sometimes, depending on the kind of seed, it takes a, a, a while before you begin to see the manifestation of it. And I think this is why Jude would want us to say that we should be, um, we should be take care and be earnest in the defense of the things that has been, uh, of the faith that has been once delivered so that it be not corrupted. Because whilst I'm not saved by the um, understanding or the knowledge of um, the word, and I think I may have uh, shared this before, whilst the, the written word or the Bible or the, the, the pages are not, is not necessarily what saves me, because it's my faith in Christ that saves me. But what the written word does, it, it's the foundation upon which my faith is based, right? So if I can tamper with the foundation of what, what generates faith in your heart for you to place your faith in Christ, if I can tamper with that, if I can make it um, corrupt it a little bit, then I can actually bring down the whole house, right? If, if the word of God is corrupted, if the word of faith, as Paul would call it, he calls it the word of faith, um, Jude says is the, 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 the faith once delivered, right? <clears throat> the, and that's the tenets of, the, of scripture. If one can tamper with that, then he can tamper with the whole of one's faith. Um, if I can introduce some erroneous doctrine into one particular area, and the thing with, with, with errors and with sin is that they don't, they don't stay confined in the place we put them. They, they grow like cancer, right? They begin to affect everything and every thinking and it influences and affects everything. One of the things that you, you'll find with um, Calvinists and a, a lot of churches who are uh, that are Calvinist based is that for instance, uh, when it comes to the gift of the Holy Spirit, they don't, they don't, they, they, they're not big on it. They don't, they don't even think that it's relevant to us. Now, you might think, where did they, how did that happen? But it starts from where you begin to allow certain things enter your heart. And then after a while, it just, infri it just infiltrates into other parts. And so there are parts of scriptures that you begin to debate and fight and contest with, you know. Um, and that's why it's important. Just in case somebody's thinking, uh, we're di we discussing Calvinism, we're going back to the first century AD and talking about Augustine and, and Lutherans and... Um, and there's still a lot more, you know, they're, they're, they're Calvinists, they're Armenians, they're all these people, you know, and you think, why are we talking about them? But one, we have to be, we have to know or at least be aware of them so that if we ever come up with them or we are dealing with someone who we're, we're preaching to who has been unfortunately infected by some of these doctrines, we know how to, 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 to at least tackle it and to, with gentleness and with love uh, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, you know, address such things and and um, uh, and leave. So yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's that's why these things. That's why we discuss them, and it's good to know about them. Um, um, and if you're interested, like Pastor Paul said, you can um, do some research and understand a bit more. But at least generally, it's good to be aware of these things so that you can defend against them when when they try to infiltrate. Yeah. Yeah. I think if I may say, Brother Chunji, thank you for sharing that because. Yeah. And Brother Tim, because uh, when I was at university in Cardiff, uh, in Wales, um, I'd rather not mention people or certain groups, but some of the people in Cardiff and Wales have even gone beyond Calvin. <laughs> so what's known as hyper-Calvinists now. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I'm being very discreet here. I won't mention, but one, there was one group of hyper-Calvinists in um cardiff and they would not have fellowship with other christians yeah yeah mm -hmm. it became like a cult mm -hmm. it was recognized you know this was recognized in the university and the, 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 yeah they, the, the, they were totally exclusive and when i shared um because obviously i was a younger christian at university you know about like we practice the gifts of the holy spirit for today praying for people and, uh, you know, seeing miraculous healings. Oh, no, no, no. They yeah. would not have it. They yeah. had a secessionist yep. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. position that the gifts of the Holy Spirit ended at the end of the first century. Well, yeah. Yeah. we know from the New Testament there is no reference to that effect. Yeah. And from yeah. what we've seen here in Nigeria or when I was a missionary in India, you know, thank the Lord, we've seen many, many healings. 
I mean, mm -hmm. today, not just not just in the first century. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. Yep. Indeed. Hmm. Okay, so um, that's our that's our theology section for the year. <laughs> I think in case some <laughs> were kind of trying to break down all the all the isms and words and you dropped in uh Armini, arminianism or uh, how do you say it um mm -hmm. as well which yeah which is the other end of what the uh, the one that you, you tend to see that gets um compared with um Calvin, Calvin. calvinism is uh, arminianism which is named after a, a, a dutch um theologian i i believe and, and mm -hmm. yes he so, was yeah, yeah. Not, yeah. not going to get into into that, but that you know, as as we say, you, you get a spectrum on all of these things. That even the Arminianism then has its own, but then you could see, or you could argue where the errors are in that as well. So in all, in all of these things, it's it's really straight sticking to what the Word says mm -hmm. and the Word of God. I, I think that's the most important thing, and and you know, trying to now summarize where we are now after what we've um what we've studied tonight or, or, or listened to somewhat tonight that it's the, the key thing that we want to remind ourselves is to um to know the key things that we need to know in the word of god to be convinced and fully convinced ourselves in what the word says and what we understand that to mean and and that by knowing that by knowing the real thing you can then see when the error is being brought in and it's 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 kind of the the real thing is, is is being doused with some sort of error and when that comes in you can recognize it because you know what the what the word really says and what we really believe and we need to be able to hold on to it we need to be able to defend it and we need to be able to explain to others as well so we can help one another grow so that's um that's what i'll say uh, thank you brad for uh, for saying that because that's that that's what i was trying to say earlier on that we're, we're not just going through this just for the sake of it, it it really has a purpose and and one of the key things is for us to be able to establish ourselves and have a solid base in in being able to um to stand for what we believe um that, that the scriptures are saying okay um so we, we have only five minutes left if anyone has any questions that you want to raise we can we, we can take it now and and save it till next week or you you send it in um Otherwise, we we'll start to think about wrapping up. Any any last last minute thoughts or questions? And if not, we will. Hi, good evening. I do have a question. Maybe I'm but let me just pause it about this. I was just pondering about this whole um thing that I don't know if we've had this conversation before around um uh, what they call it again. Ugh. The Earth's um, global warming, yes. And what is the Christian perspective? <laughs> what is the biblical perspective of global, global warming in the sense that the Earth is depleting? Um, and everything about the book of Revelations um, and God saying he's going to obviously destroy this Earth. So what is really, what is the Christian perspective? I think that's my question. If you understand what I'm saying. Okay, so your question, if 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 I just try and understand and get it right, so is your question that what is the Christian view on? What not really Christian? Let me let me say what's the what's the biblical perspective, which is obviously the, the biblical Christian. perspective on global yeah. warming specifically, or the, the on global yeah. warming and the, obviously global warming is predicated on the fact that the Earth is depleting. We're destroying the Earth, so mm. resources are depleting. Um, and not just global warming, but even the environment, everything about, you know, resources are becoming limited because of the way of waste. And that's impacting, that's, so it has various um, elements. Global warming is part of them, but also the debate about the oceans, you know, so all of that, all, all the elements of the earth are depleting. What is the biblical perspective on that? Right. So that's um, 
is a week enough to research for this, but that's um, that's an interesting question. Um, so let's get our thinking caps on and uh, <laughs> and uh, get ready for next week. So the, the biblical perspective on on the earth depleting or resources depleting. Um, so global warming was cited as an as an example or a kind of consequence to. Um, to the to man's treatment of the earth or shall we call it man's treatment of the earth um, oceans rising and all these other things that um yeah so th this is quite an interesting one because you know even even outside outside the faith when you speak to people you know people either do believe that man has an effect on the earth or some people actually don't believe that we have any effect on the earth and some people will try to, to put a timeline on these things than in the context of um, a much longer timeline, all of these global warmings and, and this ice age and this age and that age is actually, um, anyway, I'm, I'm not going to spoil it, but yeah. So I think, I think this is one that I, I like it because it, yeah, I, I think it helps us to think and be more, uh, to be practical, to be realistic. And once again, when these questions come up and, and come up to us and, um, you know what what is what is our view based on what the bible says so the biblical perspective so next week um that's our homework mm -hmm. yeah let's be let's be father we we thank you lord for tonight thank you lord for um this opportunity to just come into your presence to uh, sit at your feet and to bask in your presence and to hear your words and to listen to the words of life thank you father for as we have looked into the perfect law of liberty um and just mm. try to understand we we thank you for your holy spirit who is able to even break it down further um to us in our hearts and in our minds and at our own times and to expound and explain the scriptures to us even more than man can do and so lord we thank you for that for that which you've heard we thank you for the transformation that's already occurred and we thank you for that, which you will also do when you begin to expound this even to us on a private level and later on as we go into our day in Jesus' name. Thank you, because every word we've heard will produce um, fruit in our hearts. It will mm. firstly transform us from inside out, and it will also give us the courage to be able to um, answer and provide um, an answer for the hope that is in us when we come across people who would ask us and who would want to understand what mm. it is that we carry, that we'll be able to adequately um reflect and preach christ and mm. and, and with his word at all times in jesus mm. name as we go mm. father we, we 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 go with your grace we thank you because you have gone ahead of us yes. and you're mm -hmm. you're making a way for us and just holding us um in our hands and making us to walk in the in the path you've already blazed for us Lord. and so we thank you we give you praise mm -hmm. we thank you for strength for tomorrow as we continue to wait thank you mm. for the grace to wait and to hear and to listen um, to the things you will say to us. Uh, mm -hmm. And we just say thank you, Father God. Thank you for everything. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Amen.